you can hide yourself because like it's annoying to me. I had a fucking panic attack. We had the the call with Catherine Liu last night. I fucking like we were talking and then it like came time to actually talk about what we were writing. And I had a fucking panic attack, like in the middle of the Zoom call. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? It was horrible. What'd you do? I just nutted up and, and tried to fucking grit through it. Mm. That's why you got your <laughs> gallon of water there, man. Dude. In case, of, in case of panic attack. I, just... I was I was hiding behind it a little bit. There you go. <laughs> That's your, your, your comfort object, you know? There's, there's nothing wrong with that, bro. Like I had so many good ideas I wanted to share with her and get her like input. And then when it came time to talk, I was like, um, 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 um started um, sweating. I'm rubbing, I'm rubbing your glue. I'm rubbing your glue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was yeah, hilarious, you know, dude. Your heart is pounding and you are like, hey, I don't know. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> I, I think it's it's it must be weird for some academics um, to recognize that because their work is exiting the academy and going into these more um, I don't know, neurotic spaces. Fields. Yeah, there you go, erotic spaces. Uh, to find that they have, you know, uh, if they had an OnlyFans account, they'd have a ready set base of uh, of subscribers. <laughs> and it must be just really weird for that. Now, I'm not saying Catherine Liu has should have an OnlyFans account or that I would be a subscriber. Uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I've but, had I've had but. less satisfying experiences. Um, hopefully, she never sees this video. I'm sure she won't. Oh, we will link it to her. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> give her a good, give her a good time stamp, Catherine Liu. <laughs> the way yeah. to Adam the PMC entirely is get, get, get a episode. get an only fan account there's no pmc on the only fans actually i think <laughs> i think all the pmc is on the only fans but they they disavow it they're too ashamed to acknowledge it they would never dare admit that they're always on only fans <laughs> I, I guess I, I should re i should reconstitute that it's a uh, all the pmc are the only fan subscribers of course indeed it's a, an erotic reversal of uh, power there. And then and then they go on to say how sex work is inherently more oppressive than regular work because right. something. Because something. Because we can't figure out how to tax it appropriately, of course. That is it indeed. That's actually probably a large part of it because it, it still kind of remains, maybe not outside, but at least on the periphery. It's not fully integrated into polite society. And so they want to disavow it I'll, I'll here's here's my thinking w once once cannabis settles in federally legal and then the tax the 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 figuring out how to turn something illicit into something actually taxed well by the federal government not just individual state governments they'll 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 bleed they'll go right into sex work i'll bet money on it we have because we have a, we have our first kind of precedent of a long-standing illegal uh activity being all you know made legal at least now on a state level uh and and so we have we have sh all of the signs of what kind of fuckaroo happens when you try to make some t try to tax something for the first time basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i think the monster. systems i think the system's going to collapse before we get there so we don't well, need to well that's that's why i'm hoarding hoarding all the dogecoin boys yeah fuck yeah the only real currency there will there be the in only the real currency. You, you only measure the value of the currency by the meme which it represents well one of the largest social media companies in the world happens to use my coin of preferences uh picture as its icon so hmm. i think oh I that is that that is which that coin Twitter? my coin uh, to tw uh, yeah, yeah. Elon Musk turned the turn the Twitter logo into the the Dogecoin symbol, basically. Oh, really? oh okay. I doubled. My I wonder. Portfolio. Like, no, are you trolling or is it true? Like, what? Is it are you trolling or is it true? Like he he turned the Twitter logo into a coin. Or, or... 
I, I don't think there's a way of distinguishing between what Elon Musk does and trolling um, in general. Yeah, uh, I, think yeah. So. I think he's okay, a okay. permanent troll. Because okay. he's, huh. he's, he's adopted pure chaos and uh, yeah. So what, what were you saying, Nance? What, what, I wonder, your, uh... I wonder if the, the hate against Twitter is because the, the Twitter Adi are, Twitter's always been garbage. Always. Yeah. All, all platforms are, are, are trash, but I wonder if, if now, now that like the people who formerly were all about Twitter are now like, oh, Twitter's such a horrible, unreadable garbage fire. And and I wonder I wonder if that's like some self-aware. I mean, they're saying criticism. it on Twitter. <laughs> they're yeah. saying it on Twitter, of course. <laughs> yeah. Like it and it, if you I, mention that though, what they'll say is, oh yeah. So so what you're saying is uh we can't have something and critique it, right? It's like so. So yeah. you're typing this on an iPhone. So therefore, yeah, you, don't have, you, you can't woo, woo, do woo. that, right? iPhone, yes. Venezuela, woo woo woo. Yeah, but the reality is, if you think it's a problem, then you can stop using it. There, there are ways to stop using. Yeah, it. I've, I had a Twitter and I followed porn stars, um, and I I did try to like tweet out blog posts and shit back in the day, but. It's good for following That's how you got in the Slavo porn way. stars. That's how you got in the yeah. Yeah, Catherine exactly. Lou. Catherine Lou. Catherine Lou. Catherine Lou horny this. post. He's going to hate this video. <laughs> See, if we had this conversation before that, before that thing, you you wouldn't have had any kind of any kind of anxiety whatsoever. You'd have gotten all of your latent uh you That's know, exactly it, dude. Yeah, yeah. Drive would be out and it would be cool, you know. <laughs> Well, we gave uh, right. Jordan <clears throat> until 15 past the hour. Yeah. Um, so, okay. We can jump in. All right. Um, oh, shit. I got the wrong fucking notes up. That's all right. All right. Uh, in the father more, in father more than father himself. The split which the judgment of the notion brings despite the deceptive first impression, is therefore not simply a split between the notion and its empirical actualization. For example, between the notion of a table and empirical tables, which indeed depended on circumstances more or less correspond to their notion. If it were simply that, then we would be concerned with a simple tension between the ideal, the ideal notion, and its always incomplete realization. In the end, finding ourselves again on the level of reflective judgment, since the ideal real relationship is a, is a typical relationship of reflection. The moment with which we are actually concerned in the judgment of the notion is more subtle. The split is born within the notion itself. The reflectivity of which we have just spoken is indicated by the question, is the notion itself something adequate to itself? True, Hegel talks of the circumstances on which it depends whether the house is good, say really a house. However, the point here is not that no empirical house can completely correspond to its notion, but that in what appears as external circumstances in which is actualized the notion of a house, yet another notion is already at work, which is no longer that of a house, although it corresponds to the house more than the house itself. Here we are alluding to the dialectic which is displayed in the well-known paradox of saying about some non-X that is more X than X itself. For example, about some skin flint. He's more Scots than the Scots themselves. About a loving stepmother that she is more motherly than the mother herself. About a fanatical janissary that he is more Turk than the Turks themselves. Or like more human than human. Shit like that. Dude, I was thinking the same fucking thing. I was thinking the same fucking thing. This little Rob Zombie break here, man. Oh, that's Philip K. Dick, dude. Oh, god damn it. God damn you, Rob Zombie, always appropriating other people's art. Get an OnlyFans uh, account. The lack of identity which impels movement in judgment of the notion is thus not the lack of identity between the notion and its realization, but extends to the fact that the notion can never correspond to itself, be adequate to itself. 
because as soon as it fully realizes itself, it passes into another notion. And X, which is fully realized as X, is more X than X itself, and so no longer X. In the lack of identity between the notion and its actualization, the surplus is therefore on the side of actualization, not on the side of the notion. The actualization of a notion produces some notional surplus over the notion itself. Can we can we discuss this this chunk here? Yeah. Okay. Um. So so, so I found uh, this is one of the this particular part right here is the reason why I had to reread this chapter so many times just because he, he's repeating himself so many times it tells me it's important. Um. I got I I finally realized that he's he's a, I my impression of what he's trying to say is that um that the material reality the material transcends the ideal and so what and, and what you end up with is a is a that strangely the ideal ends up with a like more i don't know retained inertia or something to drive possibly more uh like to, to keep the gap extended each mm -hmm. time so some being more human than human the aspect of of humanness that becomes more is even even more of a there 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 becomes even more of a gap for more shit to be piled into what to what the notion of human would even be so you have like you have like the various the various predicates of of humanity like um uh we're curious and we're industrious and all that shit and once once you've once you've got that got all of those down you, you've just created more gaps in between each of those things to fill with other with other possible predicates um right and maybe maybe find more exceptions as well to to further subcategorize yeah. and and hone in on yeah exactly yeah exactly there's the, each each time you name a rock that you know that that we aren't or a substance substance that's not in us you've 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 made room i guess for more for more names of rocks and substances that are not that are not in us and that that's where that's what i think what the 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 heavy part at the end is that the the actualization of a notion produces some notional surplus over the notion itself and he he reiterates this later too mm -hmm. there's a nice example of this in the defense of lost causes he discusses Che Guevara and he says like something like so in Guevara we see because after the Cuban revolution everything he did was a failure but he nevertheless persisted and like uh, went to the end like he never got discouraged and just pursued a, a new and a new new thing and a new thing and each time he failed he persisted and like Zizek's take is like like in Guevara he, we see a kind of inhumanity because a normal human would just collapse probably at some point but he like embodies this like part this like notion of humanity as a driven being and so he's inhuman but through this very inhumanity you can see like like he realizes humanity human. so much that he becomes inhuman yeah mm. like and so it's only only through that can we have more more of a gap because he gave us more aspirational notionness to aspire to. Yeah, notional yeah. surplus. I think I think is what you're probably uh, trying to. Uh, I like this idea of notional surplus. I think that that particular word should should have come up more. Frankly, mm. I think notional surplus because you know this will tie back to the to the Marxian language that was being used before as well, talking about class struggle as the um, oh man, I lost it. Damn it, I lost it. <laughs> I would have to go back and recover that. Damn it. Yeah, that was mm. was that in the first section of this chapter or was that in chapter two? It's all a bloody nightmare at this point. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I can, when when I can control uh, it for it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's we'll, also, we'll keep pushing. Yeah. So like the notion of surplus is contingent in a way because it comes from the 
actualization so from the material side so you could not deduce it from like the notion itself you have to right it has to be actualized in a it's kind of a contingent way because everything is like the surplus mm -hmm. comes from materiality and like you cannot predict it cool. right so, right yeah, yeah, yeah okay so i i did i did recover it um he, he notes the uh the class struggle is none other than a name for this split this unfathomable mm. limit which can't be objectivized located within this uh the social totality um it's precisely this fact that there is nothing that is not political which prevents society from being conceived as a whole mm -hmm. um, even if we determine this whole with the predicate political and say all is political but the point is is that if you if class struggle weren't there to to create that to to drive that inertia there would not be society class struggle is essentially uh or society's a contingency of society is class struggle yes yeah Okay, and you think this applies? Okay, that's interesting because, like, with the class struggle, it's a, a real core around which, like, all of the other uh, aspects of society are kind of revolving. So here, what would be the? So like, we have some real core around which the notion would revolve or something. No. Do you know? I wonder if he didn't mean to have two two versions of class struggle, one being a title case and the other being a lower case. So one is one to, to be the predicate of society and then the, the other one to be the uh like sub, the object or the, mm. the OJ or the yeah the empty signifier. Yeah, because it's interesting from where does the movement come? Like, why does the notion <laughs> and the movement comes from the materiality? Oh, well, so I... so I would say the nature of, of struggle as, as perceived by humans is the need to resolve the struggle, right? But the fact is, is the aspect of class, class struggle being the, a contingency of, so, of the social it means that it's impossible to resolve. So we have we have this we have the engine of progress inherent to that. You can only make progress if there is a struggle, right? But and if the struggle is infinite, then you then you would assume that you that's how you have the constant progress. Um, and if you were to somehow somehow overcome class struggle, the only way that I mean the nuclear bomb is one way to do it. I suppose you could end everything. Uh, but aside from that, um, maybe a Borg situation. Um, that there's no there's no way that that humanity itself would still be present in a society where class struggle wasn't as is... as as currently um, defined or as as currently understood. So like um, yeah, if you removed say... class struggle, the so if you remove the class struggle, like mm, the notion of society would correspond to itself so like we would have an organic society in which everything has its place and there is no contradiction so mm. and some, some some somewhere he says said something weird like that the object is only the like the fact that we have objects so an object is the result of the fact that the notion doesn't correspond to itself so that was really weird and so you could I say that, yeah I, I dug into that. Um, there's so I think this is where it's it's resting a lot more on Hegel than on on Lacan because the, we we can only distinguish between object and subject on the basis of of what it has agency in the Hegelian sense. And so both of them though have that split within itself of the notion. It's just a question of of whether an object cannot have drive. Basically, humans mm. our subjects can have drive. But an object cannot have drive. So, and again, this is where the the last paragraph is really fucking important because he lays out where where do all of these things fit. And he doesn't. Even, he makes graphs and he doesn't use this part for a graph. I don't know, I'm a little pissed about this. <laughs> um, but the but the thing is is that yeah. So the object has a has essentially the same kind of characteristics as the subject in that yes, it has a notion. Which to have a notion then is to have the split between the substance and well subject the substance and object i guess so is that what uh, what uh 
people are terrified of of AI coming to life and and developing its own agency, but people don't seem to really give a shit about how just kind of like rote automation destroyed you know the workforce and and took Dude. jobs away from people and people want to say oh there'll be more jobs and yeah sure whatever but that doesn't seem to bother people but the doesn't bother tradesmen that, <laughs> yeah but the fact that it might uh develop its own agency seems to terrify people more than the fact that it already has uh taken away so many opportunities for meaningful work and and work is how we actualize ourselves in the world and and the ai has taken that away from us and people are just like yeah give me more algorithms but then they're horrified that maybe it'll start thinking and get its own agency this may be a bit of a digression um but mm -hmm. i i i have some thoughts on that uh, lucas are you okay if we continue on this digression yeah sure that's cool okay so so the way i was thinking about this i was, I was actually that's so interesting Nance. i was just talking with my wife about this yesterday um i think that the actual anxiety for people who seem to be showing anxiety with this is that when when we see this this chat bot working so well one of the things we're seeing without noticing what we're seeing is a reflection of what we may look like as a true neoliberal, a perfect neoliberal subject, which is true, actually an object at that point. What we're yeah. seeing is an object that reflects subjectivity in a way that is very uh, uncanny to us and therefore terrifying because we see what will replace us in the ideal of the neoliberal capital environment, which is a simply input output uh, atomized, con inf infinitely controllable subject or, well, really object at this point. And so what we see is our own objectification reflected back at us without being able to, most of us don't have the vocabulary to, to even grasp that's what's happening when we're seeing it. And, and so just like when you see a just a little bit too good looking robot facial feature that just, but it just doesn't quite, doesn't mm -hmm. quite work that that's an that County Valley uh, situation. We're seeing this, but just reflected in language. And so the the fact is that the chatbot will never become um, sentient because the chatbot is a it exists entirely in in a symbolic, it's like a pure symbolic perversion, and what you what it has no ability for de, for desire, because it yeah. is an object and not a subject. It has no drive and it has no desire, and so there's it, we see that and we see the terrifying cliff that we're headed off of that that you know our our economy wants us to be just like this and if we don't be like this then we will be replaced by the thing that is like this we don't want either of those things to happen yeah man that's, there's an awful lot there there's an yeah, awful that, lot there <clears throat> it's a funny coincidence because yesterday at the bar with my friends we also talked about chatbots and like you went in a wholly different direction than us because we, we were like it's uncanny because like it's it seems that it can generate those symbolic responses and it could even say like uh i feel pain or something but also like we know that it doesn't but it's uncanny like how many into how many parts of our lives this will infiltrate so like in the future probably humans will be like people will be like I read only books written by people, you know, it's like not yeah. by the channels. It's a hipster thing. <laughs> yeah. There will be, be there will be a cottage core ver variant of yeah. of right now where yeah, boutique, there will be people <laughs> boutique crafts. Um that'll be a luxury and and yeah. yeah, dude, that's hilarious. And then we'll have the obverse of that. Well that we'll have the human beings uh emulating chatbot on mm -hmm. like as a as a kink or something there'll be yeah. like in a, a, a kind of kink like that i i feel like we're we're within 10 years from a uh politician acting as proxy for a for a chat bot basically i i expect that to to exist i think we should all expect that to well, exist. They, are be a kind of, they already kind of do act like yeah that, so precisely like, yep. they just <laughs> respond to, yeah. to the po polls and the algorithms 
Um, the Zizek take that like we are so scared, but like the things which are more obvious right now, they were already here. So like this kind of symbolic bot. Like See, the only issue I take with Zizek on the... what's that? If we had Cyber Sin, the <laughs> ooh, the fucking Chilean fucking social computer internet before the internet that the CIA went in and cooed him for. Uh that is such a dope story, like with the cyber sin. Yeah. But what if cyber sin was just, just a neoliberal chatbot? <laughs> maybe it's a good thing that they cooed him. No, maybe well they cooed him so they could take it and convert it into a neoliberal chatbot. It was probably wow. cha- it it was probably had the the uh, uh, the opposite you know that's that's the thing when you when you think about why is it that we have these top tier technologists and then also elon musk who i don't believe counts uh, but somehow is the big name on this on this as a signatory on this uh let's all just kind of pause guys let's just pause oh, what what is their actual problem it certainly isn't something that's going to help us by pausing there's no fucking way right and so the reality is they're probably witnessing the the likeliness that well, shit, if you strip all of the actual desire, all of the drive from a rational system, it starts doing things that might look a little commie. Right. Probably. Yeah. And I'm sure that's pretty terrifying to the people who control the wealth at this moment. It's funny because I heard that like Google had those AI models way before this and they were mm-hmm. scared to release them. It was so funny to me. Like, why and maybe because of this it's the communism it's the, yeah 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 fine. the reds they're gonna get us but you cannot let the bot into twitter because it immediately becomes a nazi so. yeah <laughs> it's terrible so do we go on or? yeah yeah where are we at the lack of identity uh, i can i can read from there so oh the no, the, the, I... this kind of split actually. Sorry. This kind of split. All right. Oh, that's right. That's right. This this kind of split is at work in the paintings of the American realist Edward Hopper. Uh, Hopper has claimed in some of his well-known statements that he does not like people, that people are uninteresting, that they are strange to him. Uh, have you guys already taken the time to like look up these paintings? He's got that famous Nighthawk one. Have you seen these? um did, let me just uh i think did it's he do, actually useful yeah screen share that because i think i'm thinking of like the the dude who make paints trees is that the same guy uh well he paint from what i've seen he paints mostly like buildings um but okay. but that being said when i say from what i've seen that's that's uh did he do like a farmhouse with a tree on a hill yes yeah that's, something like that but he has that famous one that you often see re uh, like basically memed, which is like a, a picture of a diner. I don't know what's up with here. Internet let right me now. stop, stop the screen share so you can pull that up. I'm I for some reason I I have an internet connection, but um, oh, obviously I can't or else, that. um, so that ain't. I don't know why. I can do it. Wait, give me a sec. Do you see it? There we are. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So the one in the top left was the one that I was referring to. Is the oh the diner? Yeah, the diner one. So uh, what what he points out in this in this section is is how the the human humans are there, but they're really just I think they're just there to provide context to the scene. In fact, it's kind of and they're they're always doing something basically useless or boring. There's nothing really happening with the humans. And the scene is supplemental. Is what's, yeah, they're just there. And and I was reading something else about his his tendency to you know he'll have a a window half open. Mm. He'll have signs of there being a human without in in cases where there may not even be a human. Mm-hmm. Um, this yeah, one is that, like wow, very interesting. So you know, and the door the door is open. Someone must have opened it, right? But the most interesting thing is is the lack, probably even a lack of a human, which I think feels jarring to us. It reminds me of the liminal spaces fad yep. that's happened over the last couple of years. 
that mm-hmm. that uncanniness. Very inter- very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. It's certainly yeah. worth uh, looking at. So shit, I'll, I'll just read while you guys uh, if you guys want to keep looking at that. Um, oh, we can go back to the text. I guess. Sure. All right. I, I've got it up on my screen too. Uh, by the way, I find it easier to just read on my own one. Let's see here. So uh, I'll wait until you get it up. So we got. It. I'll wait until you get it up, buddy. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> tug him tug him Remember, it's variable length. Don't don't be surprised <laughs> when you see I'm on the short end. Fair, fair. Uh, the people are uninteresting. That they are strange to him. And one can actually sense in his pictures how the human figure is depicted neutrally, without interest, whereas there's a very much more intense feeling for particular types of objects, above all his famous empty sunlit windows. In a very precise sense, one could say that in these objects, although or rather just because man is absent from them, the human dimension is intensely striking that if we could hazard a Heideggerian formula, this dimension is presented by means of the very absence of man. Man is more present in these traces than in his direct physical presence. Only through such traces, a half-raised curtain in the window and so on, is the authentic human dimension effectively rendered, as in the well-known experience after somebody's death, when it is by going over his remaining everyday personal objects, his writing table, little objects in his bedroom, that we become aware of who the deceased really was, that is to say, in Hegel's of his notion. So the detritus the detritus that makes our experience the shit that we leave behind. And uh, th- I think just like we were talking about in terms of the AI, the talking about more human than human, I think the thing that scares us is that that lack of humanity behind something that seems infinitely more capable than we are at our own, at our own technology of language. <laughs> Hopper's paintings thus depict some, depict some non-X inanimate dead objects empty streets fragments of apartment buildings which is more x than x itself in which human dimensions are revealed more than in man himself and as we've already seen the supreme case the case in which very the very exemplar of this paradoxical reversal is the signifier itself as soon as we enter the symbolic order the thing is more present in the world that designates it than in its immediate presence the weight of an elephant is more conspicuous when we pronounce the word elephant than when a real elephant enters the room. Uh, I have a note on this section <clears throat> that uh, where I, I, I noted that this seems counterintuitive since the real is supposed to be that which cannot be symbolized. But he's talking about in the symbolic order that the thing is more present in the world. So we have the difference between reality and real essentially in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like when you when when I s- talk about a tree even when i'm talking about a, a particular tree i still can't move beyond my idealized image of that particular tree that i'm talking about the the fact that we are languaged and and we use you know notions and concepts to symbolize the world we can't get beyond those notions and and those symbols to what is signified beyond them mm-hmm. I, uh, I think I, when he talks about the real elephant so this reality symbolic distinction it's um imminent, imminent to the symbolic itself so like the mm-hmm. things and like mm-hmm. words all of those are symbolized because an elephant it, like real elephant we it's all it's also symbolized so because mm-hmm. otherwise you wouldn't perceive an elephant but like nothing I, so. I think we have a historical we have a historical actually empirical evidence in history about this exact dynamic in the uh the concepts of pink and blue in in uh in painting uh that you know we didn't really have words <clears throat> we did not have words for pink and we didn't really have words for blue up to up to a certain point and in terms of in terms of the way that we can determine whether or not people were even thinking about these concepts would be present in whether or not there were words for them Mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting because we were obviously seeing 
color pink and color blue. We're seeing the sky, but we weren't thinking about it in terms of a color. We're thinking about it in terms of, because for the longest time we couldn't even, we didn't even have a pigment to represent it. So we didn't have a word to use to describe the pigment and, and, uh, you know, you can kind of look into this. It's uh, to me, it's it, it's one of those things that seems trivial until you read something like like this. When you talk about the weight of the elephant being more conspicuous when we say the word than when the elephant itself is there, and the fact that people were just going around not knowing pink existed until somebody managed to to coin it. Or gravity, how gravity didn't didn't really exist until Newton. Well, and, it. And, I mean, it was and, there, and then it, and it, it well, it, you know, it's funny that you say that, Nance, because gravity actually like isn't there. That's that's right. that's the interesting thing. Like Newton coined a thing; he kind of in uh, in a sense intuited something, um, but then then you know, a certain amount of time goes along, and then Einstein come comes up and goes, you know, it's kind of like doesn't, but sure, and like we're yeah. stuck with both we're stuck with both now we're stuck with that fact that gravity exists and doesn't at the same time hmm. what's I think that that's sublime do? object where he talks about gravity yeah. someone hmm. wants to take, there... take over so it's it's like the this this uh, this passage from the when the x becomes uh, like the actualization of a notion becomes more notion than notion I don't get the passage to the signifier. So like, it would be like the word for the elephant is more appropriate to the notion of an elephant than the elephant itself. It's like the the yeah. the actual elephant is always going to fail to live up to your to the notion of elephant in in certain ways. It's going to have a strange color, or it's going to be bigger or smaller, or it's not going to. It will yeah, have a body, smell. Yeah, yeah. Your it will image. have a smell that you you don't have a word for yet. But you see, like he be before he said that, like the notional surplus, it comes from the actualization. So in this mm -hmm. case, would the notional surplus come from the word it's kind of a uh, signifier? It would seem that way if you like in it's conjunction. So, so like if you have once you start putting words to it, right? and you have the thing itself there present, you start putting words, you'll start realizing that there are now going to be more words necessary to tune those words that you're using. Because you can say gray, right? But then you have this thing standing in front of you and it's not exactly gray. So now you have to define what not exactly gray means. And then you have no. to start getting into, well, is it all gray or is it just parts of it gray? And then so on and so forth. At, at which point, when you have the real right there in front of you, and it's it's bombarding you with your with in in the imaginary uh, register with all this input. You you're now you're now plumbing every aspect of your symbolic your language to try to come up with things to justify what that that um, disparity between what you're seeing and what you uh -huh. have words for. You're gonna uh -huh. have to you're eventually gonna fail to have words to to adequately describe everything about it. And so paradoxically, the surplus is on the side of the signification because, like in the imaginary, you see the plenitude of like something, but the surplus comes when you try to put it into words. So maybe Precisely. that's yeah okay. And the fact that it exists in the real means there will always be something, some aspect of it that will defy your sim your ability to symbol symbolize it. That is that is the essential case of the real in that it cannot be symbolized. So, and so this it, is what drives the inertia towards the symbolic side of things mm, because you will mm. always be you'll always be what what we do as humans as agential subjects is we are inexorably driven to come up with ways to describe our experience until we aren't until we become boring pieces of shit that just you know do nothing but those of us that are actually agential that are actually trying to transcend ourselves that that is what that is what we do at least i, mm. I believe that's what he's trying to say here mm. mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 so to me it's hard because it's all in the symbolic so like the real elephant is in the symbolic and it doesn't coincide with real the 
elephant you see, the, the animal, it's in the symbolic, it's symbolized, but the, it doesn't coincide with itself, so that you have to symbolize it more. And so it's so frustrating because we are always in the symbolic here. So like, mm. it, it, the real element is that the symbolic does not coincide with itself. So you have the, you know, the surplus, but like, we can go on, maybe it will be. <laughs> more well, that, that feeling you're feeling, that, that discomfort, in not being able to 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 put to words what you're thinking is exactly the exactly the circumstances he's talking about. Mm-hmm. That's that's you are what you're experiencing is the that anxiety is the experience of plumbing for symbolic you know meaning in this in this thing. I mean, it's strange. We have an inverted. We have again. We have this Hegelian aesthetic to the writing which forces us to actually experience the concept that he is describing when we are reading what he's describing Mm -hmm. so that doesn't make us feel any better (laughs) yeah no no it is it is what it is but like in a way we only speak because the objects they don't coincide with themselves so like yeah yeah that's why we have language if they did we wouldn't need to speak we would be animals at for the animals, time, they all coincide. Uh, so it's, it's so weird because normally we would say we speak so so that because we speak, we are in the symbolic, the things don't coincide with themselves, with themselves. But now we say because the things don't coincide with themselves, we can speak. And it's like, you know. I, you I like how, you, Adam, you just said it, it, uh, to animals, they do coincide. And I imagine my dog, she sees the world as she sees the world and that's it and there's yeah there's no there's no gaps for her it's you know everything is you know it could be like things with with animals like dogs and monkeys and octopi and so on animals that that we perceive as a a spark of intellect we also perceive anxiety in those animals as well yeah it could be that they're Mm -hmm. donning symbolic their the you know their symbolic registers are actually nascent and are are, yeah. are happening and that's what's driving their anxiety and but also what's driving i guess you would say our natural affinity to them uh so a dog perhaps is mm-hmm. is different than say a squirrel in fact the concept of domestication and wildness probably has to do with the we're the we're symbolic. languageifying our domestic that's that is the process of domestication is introducing fucking them language yeah. we're splitting uh. their notion we're splitting their notion <laughs> yeah that's Wow. That's horrible. I, <laughs> it, it, I mean, they didn't ask us to, that's for sure. Uh, that's something we did to them. It's. It, I guess it would be interesting to see if that wasn't something that was done to us. Mm, you know? Mm. Uh-oh, Xenu, once again, I told you it was Xenu. <laughs> you always get back to that sign. I told you, you'll never get me in there, buddy. I'm never taking the test. <laughs> hey, I got to run and grab some coffee. I'll be right back. Perfect. Cool. cool. Uh, I will go to the bathroom. It's a good idea. Oh, that does work pretty well. Is that a cat or a dog? It's a cat. It's it's me more than myself. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice. Nice, very nice. Why did you go back? No, stay. 
I know, I know. It's, <laughs> it's a much less, much less punchable face. That's for sure. Okay. So, if, are we here? We, okay. They're in. Mm -hmm. They're in. Okay. Therein consists the enigma of the status of the father in psychoanalytic theory. The non coincidence of symbolic and real father means precisely that some non father, maternal uncle, the supposed common ancestor, totem spirit, ultimately the signifier father itself, is more father than the real father. It is for this reason that Lacan designates the name of the father this ideal agency that regulates legal symbolic exchange as the paternal metaphor. The symbolic father is a metaphor, a metaphoric substitute, a sublation of Hebung, of the real father in its name, which is more father than father himself. Whereas the non-sublated part of the father appears as the obscene, cruel, and oddly impotent agency of the superego. In a way, Freud was already aware of it when, in Totem and Taboo, he wrote that, following the primordial parricide, the dead father returns stronger than when he was alive. The crucial word here is returns, which indicates how we should conceive another mysterious sounding preposition of Lacan, that father is a symptom. The symbolic father is a symptom insofar as it is the return of the repressed primordial father the obscene and traumatic father enjoyment that terrorized his heart. Well, do we stop? Or... I have a note here. Okay. I have a note here that uh, occurred to me, and I wonder if anybody else uh, has had this experience. Uh, I had a note on returning, um, sorry, stronger than when he was alive. Uh, so like, when I, the, one of the reasons I joined the army was that uh, this fucking recruiter asked me how you know how i felt about myself how my life was going and shit and, and like you know at the time i was the manager of a hot dog shop and like my girlfriend worked there so i could have like sex in the back and like we would we would literally like pound beers in the back of the hot dog shop. i mean like i was really enjoying my life i was really Goodness. enjoying my life and then this fucking asshole asked me, you know, how I felt about myself and like, you know, how we had just been attacked by the, the, uh, angry, angry Muslims. And, you know, did I feel like I was okay just being here, not helping and shit. And it caused me to think about it. And it, it fully flipped me. I was like, wow, I am a piece of shit. I'm just a consumer. I'm doing nothing with my life. I'm not helping the country and all this shit. And so I joined. And when I joined, that act of joining made me feel like a better person. Like I was already a soldier. I had already mm. done all the things. I hadn't even been to basic training yet. But like I immediately took on that like better personness, um, mm. which uh, which is is crazy. And and I realized that I mean that's like that's basically how diet culture works too. Like mm -hmm. you don't yeah. you say you're on a diet. You say you're on a diet and the saying is the important part because yeah. if you don't tell anybody, oh, then you're yeah. not actually on a diet. Right. And you so want to be seen more, as one who diets. And, and this is where the issue of racism comes up. People are more concerned with being called a racist than the fact of racism. Mm -hmm. Right. If, if you, if you took away the ability of someone to be called a racist, we would actually be able to address racism, which is actually why some, some people working in that space are, are exceedingly, are imploring people to stop referring to individual humans as racists because mm -hmm. that it doesn't help the situation. It just makes people knee jerk mm -hmm. because in a sense there's, you know, racism is the issue, but for some reason, the racist is more racist than racism, than racism itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, you can, so people can feel like that having this symbolic mandate is, uh, and, it's supposed to be just like a, a low thing, but it's really the the thing which you care about and not the real action. 
Right. And that's yeah. that's why we as a as a society, at least Western society, seems to care so much about this concept of hypocrisy, while we all know internally that we are so conflicted and such hypocrites at all times. And yet we feel just compelled to point out other people's hypocrisy as if there it carries greater weight than our own. I think this translates nice nice into drive. So like with drive, um, the so we eat and like the but the drive doesn't care about the like uh biological function of eating it cares about the little satisfaction you get while eating so this is the same like we we stopped caring about the like we don't care about the actual action we care about the symbolic surplus which is supposed to be a surplus like don't care like only because we have to do it but we uh, we really care about that so like we want more to have like a relationship status on facebook than actually to be in a relationship oh wow symbolic, yeah. Yeah. uh this is why we probably why it's possible for us to overeat is that we're we're much more concerned with the feeling of gra of sati satiety and and pu putting things in us and then uh, eventually the real catches up and we we get a stomach ache and that's this is what happens with Facebook. I don't know about you folks. When I one of the things I do not miss having quit that is the the immense loneliness in in being surrounded by seemingly hundreds of so-called friends. There's just intense loneliness. When somebody says happy birthday, you know, if you're already on Facebook, switch your birthday to some other day and yeah, witness how many yeah. people tell you happy birthday. And that's that's the real uh, slapping you in the face on the street corner. That's the absurd. <laughs> and uh it is they don't that, even that... have to do it like it happens to me because you want to be nice to people and like send mm -hmm. them and you don't know the name of your 400 friends and like it's a structural <laughs> effect you know like... but the crazy uh, sentence in this part to me is like the non-sublated part of the father appears as the obscene cruel and oddly impotent agency of the super ego so that's so weird because like so what like the dead father who was real uh this dead part is like the super egoic injunction to which bashes you dude really the, this, this okay check it out check it out i'll give you a story from my from my history all right from about i would say from about eight years old further my parents entirely checked out of my of parenting me they were fully uh, they, between between working so many hours and all that shit. I was by my fucking self. All right. And then sometime around, I don't know, I'd say I was like 14 or 15. My dad got this hair up his ass like he was going to try to be my dad out of nowhere. Mm. And started trying to tell me to do shit. And I'm already I'm already basically taking myself to school. I'm like, I'm taking care of myself entirely at this point. And uh, I, he's also at this point smaller than me. Right. And so he he's telling me to do shit. And I'm just like, fuck off, dude. And then, and then he literally tries to put hands on me and, and I fucking slapped him and I pushed him on the ground and I'm like, don't fucking do that either, dude. You you can't do shit, you know? And, and like the look in his face that that's your obscene, cruel and oddly impotent agency right there is his mm -hmm. recognition. Mm -hmm. He's, he isn't, he has no kind of father. He has none mm -hmm. of the patriarchal symbolic, uh, uh, you know, agency whatsoever. He's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he's just tried to, he's tried to exercise it and failed. And yeah, that yeah is, that, uh, that's a great example. Uh, as, like many people have this experience, me too. Like when you, at some point you see your father and you are like, like this, like you are not the notion of the father, but also the, what I meant is like the impotent agency of the super ego. But like when I read about super ego at, in other places, it seems like the super ego is not important. It's very much important. It's very much potent, and it bashes you all the time. So, I don't mm. know. Maybe he has some big, some other conception here and in mind. It's like I don't know. Maybe he will make some more connections mm. next. I can do the mm, next paragraph because this was the from from what. However, yeah, like uh, until the substitution, like. Hmm. What, however, we have to bear in mind, apropos of the primordial father enjoyment, is again the logic of the deferred action. The fact that the 
non-symbolized father changes into the horrifying specter of the father enjoyment only backwards, retroactively, after the symbolic network is already here. Father enjoyment ultimately just fills out a structural insufficiency of the symbolic function of the name of the father. Its original status is that of the of a leftover produced by the failure of the operation of sublation, which establishes the rule of the name of the father. Its allegedly original status, primordial father, results from an illusion of perspective, by means of which we perceive the remainder as the point of origins. So this is like, I think that together those two make sense. So like, mm -hmm. mm, this is the... MAGA. This is MAGA. This is nostalgic pastiche. A description of, to me is what what is meant by a nostalgic pastiche. You have the you have the sense of of a thing that existed that really never did. But you, where you are today, you're looking and you're you're trying to come up with with what it is that had you know what could you return to that might make it better than it was than it is, and that's that's the exist that's why it's something like MAGA can even exist is that people who in their lifetimes could absolutely see that there were there were things about about the time before that were were worse, but it doesn't matter because what they're what they're enjoying is is entirely in this in symbolic there's nothing real about it and so it allows them to continue that en enjoyment and they can even misperceive it as the point of origin of of their uh of their enjoyment hmm. we've maybe always longed goes... for the better days yeah yeah it's the plenitude of the past but like maybe this goes even back to the elephant so it's not that the <laughs> elephant animal is somehow full of plenitude and like some surplus. This is only an illusion which is produced by the naming of the elephant. And this is why the surplus is on the side of the signifier, because like when you start naming the elephant and putting all the predicates uh, into it, it seems to you as though this process uh, started because the original elephant was so, you know, indescribable and uh, plentiful and shit. But like, it's not true. Like you only mm. notice that it's plenty. It's plenty because you started symbolizing. So mm. yeah. So retroactivity makes it so that this makes sense. I think. Yeah. In a way. That's that's interesting. You know, I there was a so I I got into mycology really hard for a little bit there, and I can remember I absolutely remember when looking at a mushroom. A mushroom is a mushroom, and there was nothing about it that was that stood out to me. It was just a mushroom. And now when I look at a mushroom, I'm looking at individual parts of the mushroom. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about what kind of a mushroom it is. I'm thinking about where it might grow or how, how it might best grow. And that just introduces, in fact, even more questions than I originally had, which is, you know, what the fuck is this thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now this thing is like, whoa, it's so complex and stuff. Mm. Yeah. Nancy, uh, you want to take it from uh, another? Yep. In another approach, Lacan determines the name of the father as the metaphoric substitute of the desire of the mother. That is to say, name of the father or desire of the mother. To grasp it, one has only to recall Hitchcock's North by Northwest, the precise moment in the film when Roger O. Thornhill is mistakenly identified as the mysterious George Kaplan and thus hooked on his name of the father, his master signifier. It is the very moment when he raises his hand in order to comply with his mother's desire by phoning her. What he gets in return from the other, from the big other, that is to say what he gets in the place of the mother's desire he wants to comply with, is Kaplan, his paternal metaphor. North by Northwest thus presents a case of successful substitution of the paternal metaphor for the mother's desire. One is even tempted to risk the hypothesis that North by Northwest presents a kind of spectral analysis of the figure of the father, separating it into its three components, the imaginary father, the United Nations official who's stabbing in the lobby of the General Assembly, the parasite is attributed to Thornhill, the symbolic father, professor, the CIA official who concocted the non-existent George Kaplan, 
and the real father, the tragic, obscene, and impotent figure of Van Damme, Thornhill's principal adversary. Hmm. A film like Shadow movie? of a Doubt. I no. Oh, so, <laughs> Have you? Did, so I I had not, and I I was having a lot of trouble understanding, especially the the middle section uh, where he talked about when he gets in return and all that shit. Uh, I I had asked Chad GPT. I said fill out this example for someone who hasn't seen the film, and it it uh, gave me a, a something that was that was helpful to me. I don't know if y'all would, would want to hear it. It's coming from a fucking robot. Let's do it. Okay. So it, uh, so is a, in a sense, it's a bit of a rewrite um, of what he said, but so it says, um, at one point in the film, he raises his hand to call his mother who represents his desire to be recognized as successful and respectable. However, instead, instead of speaking to his mother, he's intercepted by someone else who gives him the name Kaplan which becomes his new identity and symbolizes his desire to be a successful spy. This new identity becomes his master signifier or name of the father, which replaces his previous desire for recognition by his mother. Mm. So we're talking about a, a, a process where this person is, is going through signifying chain for through that chain of signification and having, having these in these identities basically be, become sublated by the next step in the chain. Anyways, that's uh, that's what I got. It makes me it. think of Christmas Story. Uh, I don't think I can put it into words, but I feel like the movie Christmas Story with Ralphie, you'll shoot your eye out. I feel like there's some of that in there. I Maybe probably... you ought to take a note of that and, and have, yeah. you know, put that in, put that in writing and, and... I would love to hear that developed personally. I think that such GPT bit is like maybe even better than the actual film because yeah. the film the dude does not want to be. Is Kaplan. anyone surprised <laughs> that Chat GPT writes better than Slavoj Zizek? Though I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Zizek is like typing all that shit that Chat GPT puts to you, like. <laughs> He's, 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 he's imitating chat gpt he's in a cubicle somewhere imitating yeah 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 <laughs> yeah that's why he doesn't want everybody else to use it he's if they do then there will be no more need for a for a zizek we'll all be yeah. zizeks oh my goodness yeah, we could ask chat gpt to rewrite for they know what they do but uh, with different examples no, that, that would be a fun final project to, to work the download with GPT i've been to... doing that actually yeah. a little bit that would be a fun um, it, final project. Here, here's the here's the here's the problem. There's, this is where the real comes in. Um, you there isn't enough processing power to put the entire book in as one contiguous thing and have it mm -hmm. process it. And if you just like we've already talked about, if we try to go paragraph by paragraph, you it's senseless. It doesn't equal. <laughs> So yeah, at some point that will be possible, but at this moment there, there maybe we can way to actually do that. Let's see maybe we could start a maybe. fund. Hmm. Yeah, that's how we take yeah, over the world. Yeah. Is this how the proletariat in. really takes over? We de we devise Zizek bot three thousand and just elect it senator, and then eventually Manchurian president. Oh my gosh. It would be a bot where you enter a sentence and it just adds on the end and so on and so on. And so on. It's just and so on. <laughs> and so on. And so on. <laughs> yeah. And then that would that would kind of lay bare the senselessness of all of it and the endless, just meaningless repetition of everything. And that would raise our consciousness and we'd rise up. And, and we yeah. will have corresponded with our notion and become the object. <laughs> and so on. Game so over. So on. We win. Okay. A film like <laughs> Shadow of a Doubt, on the contrary, displays the dire consequences of the failure of this metaphoric substitution. The analysis of this film is usually centered on the dual relationship of the two Charlies, the young niece and her murderous uncle. What is thus left out of consideration is the presence of the crucial third element which brought them together, namely the mother's desire. Uncle Charlie visited the family in response to the mother's his sister's desire. In other words, the lesson of the film is that the dual relationship ends in a murderous impasse when the third element that mediates between its poles remains mother's desire and is not sublated into the paternal metaphor. So yeah, it's 
there was no sublation movement from a b and on this is this is where it gets this is where the political aspect of this mm. book becomes really becomes really real because this when we t again bringing it back to maga this is why we see violent extremism when there is this this intense expansion of symbolic fucking blah is that there's never there's no possible way to uh to sublate that desire and so the desire manifests in just ineffectual physical rage rage in every and direction as a consequence of uh the the neoliberalization of the family the the inability to have a successful home life a, a successful family of, of any shape or form um we have a bunch of fatherless young men who are angry but they're also motherless um and yes. And I think that's probably a key thing that a lot of people miss out. Uh, yeah. So like the mother's desire, it causes anxiety because it's real. So because desires, you don't know what it is. And like you are made anxious because you are trying to know, but you cannot. And like in the political, it would be like, no one knows what is going on because there is no like, one strong paternal authority mm -hmm. politically like a uh, because no like one knows Trump, because everyone knows yeah because like Trump everyone has an answer a paternal figure he's like he's an obscene super ego more maybe but like mm -hmm. he does not make it like sublate all of the other babu like symbolic mm -hmm. uh and like this causes anxiety because people don't know what's going on well, yeah, he's he is very conspicuously and apparently castrated, but is presenting himself as the uncastrated, uh, you know, ubermensch, uber patriarch, and and that that present that co conflict between what is presented, what we are seeing with our actual eyes, and what we are essentially being bombarded with in the symbolic uh, side of things, that conflict will never resolve until mm. it will never resolve. There's no, there's, it doesn't matter if he's assassinated, arrested, dies naturally. It doesn't matter. He will always go down as this, as this strange thing. And it's crazy because in, in that way, he's reminiscent of Jesus Christ in that way. And the, there's, there's no way to ever resolve, resolve that. And so it will, will always be a, a part of the social conflict. Um, he's also not a paternal figure because he does not lay any law. So he does not say you cannot mm -hmm. do that. He says like do everything. I don't care. Yeah. Like you know, and like that's not a father. Like that causes even more anxiety because if his followers can enjoy everything, then like they rise to they go to capital because that's what we do. And like mm -hmm. I don't know. We can go on. I think. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll read um, the ultimate proof that Hegel's articulation of the four species of, of judgment. I want to note here, Hegel did not articulate four. He articulated three. Zizek earlier in this in this chapter uh, inferred the, the fourth. fourth, and now he's saying it as if Hegel did it, and uh, so fucking caught you. Um, <laughs> anyways, Hegel's articulation of the four species of judgment does follow an inherent logic, lies in the fact that its consistency is that of the Grimasian, Grimasian, sure, semiotic square of necessity, possibility, impossibility, <clears throat> contingency. We all see the graph. I don't, I don't think me explaining it will be helpful. The fundamental category of the judgment of existence is that of impossibility. It's truth is the infinite judgment where the relationship between subject and predicate is posited as impossible. The judgment of reflection is characterized by possibility, namely the possibility of ever more comprehensible correspondence between the subject and pred predicate. The judgment of necessity asserts a necessary relationship between subject and predicate, as is evident from its very name, whereas my judgment of notion I should say, as Slavoj Zizek, exhibits the ultimate contingency upon which necessity itself depends. Um, personally, guys, I think that this, this section right here would have been so much better as a bulleted list 
because what we are seeing are bullet points just laid out as uh, as parentheticals and it's it's a bitch but uh did i i got this did you guys get this section did this make sense mm. It's weird that he says that the judgment, infinite judgment, is fundamental. So, like, oh no, fundamental category of the judgment of existence. Okay, but still, it's like impossibility. We start from the impossibility of the subject and predicate relating. Then we go to judgment of reflection. Like, I get the gray measure, uh, the, the square, and everything, but hmm. I don't know. I my 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 grasp of this I I think is like at like a 55% level and again I I know that because I went through I went through three different iterations of trying to replace his his examples with my own examples and I always found myself basically short circuited mm -hmm. um so but I but I see I see at least that what he's doing here is he is essentially re restating what he said earlier um above with the roses red with the roses red idea um and i could what i'm looking forward to oh, what was that could you scroll a bit up nonsense okay thank you yeah um but i i think where where I feel like the whole the the going from the posited as impossible is is the idea that I, I think it I think I'm re the way I'm reading that is with respect of respect to infinite judgment the infinite judgment itself is impossible and this is what lays the ability this is what makes the next step possible is in reflection that it that that there's nothing there's nothing there's no object for which every single thing could mm. be could be true and so because of that infinite judgment or the the opposite of infinite judgment that there must be something for which is not true about that and then we move on to the next step of of necessary and then contingent mm -hmm. um I expect well I think it's I think it would be important I think all of us are having trouble resolving this and I expect that will be the case for for mm -hmm. a lot of the people and what I hope is that Mikey intuits that and lays it out with with his you know working class way of getting things across um and if he doesn't then one of us ought to require the request that he does uh, mm. because i think this is this is ultimately the point of this entire chapter yeah mm -hmm. yeah um i'm i'm sorry that i interrupted you before that's like my mind is melting and i was yeah yeah <laughs> because uh, yeah. isn't it kind of weird to you guys how this chapter is <laughs> he's talking about the judgments then he went to the to situation for a bit then he goes mm -hmm. to the name of the father and it, to me, it does kind of, I have a feel for why he does that, but I don't understand why he goes to the, it's almost like in this chapter, he wants to lay out the mm, structuration of the symbolic uh, through the, <laughs> by, by analyzing judgments. And maybe this is what it is. Like he wants to show us that uh, the symbolic follow has all of these qualities like necessity, contingency yes. the impossible real and i don't know <laughs> okay yeah. so it my 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 response to that is think about i i think about the way that this chapter is laid out as is like pretty classic zizek where he's got what seem to be seven different arguments that don't seem to align that are all tied together to make a single contiguous point but you need to get through those arguments and then you need to read them backwards mm. and then you need to read them then you need to read them maybe even out of order with one another um to mm. to start to to start to see the 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 quilting point um which in this point the entire the entire quilting point 
here, the entire point of this chapter in my, from my position is him asserting that fourth judgment, the contingency within necessity. Mm -hmm. The fact that necessity itself is composed of contingencies. And he's bringing in sexuation because he's stuck with Freudian Lacanian terminology, which is, is sexuated inherently. Now, this is where having where what is sex is very helpful as a kind of a sidecar reader for this, because what she lays out is why sex is used as as that that uh, as that quilting point for consciousness and so and mm -hmm. unconsciousness um and to 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 give a just a quick overview from my understanding one of the reasons that it was used is that we can demonstrate a number of things about consciousness specifically retroactive retroactive grasp by looking at the progress of an infant into adulthood as something that is has no symbolic logic whatsoever that develops it out of what seems to be pure cloth but is simultaneously experiencing their nascent sexuality. Infants are born without the ability to produce the kinds of hormones that we eventually produce that allows us to really experience sexual drive, but we're given symbolic uh, points to understand sexual drive prior to that feeling. Then mm -hmm. we start feeling them. Shit starts getting, starts to make sense and somehow even make less sense. And this is what is is provides the fulcrum for understanding the difference between the fact or be, to understanding the fact that our unconscious is actually also thinking in just like our conscious is. And and we and they use sex to sort of prove that. That that's mm -hmm. that the unconscious has thoughts and is processing things. And we know this because of the way it returns to us in in sex in mm. in sexual concepts yeah like the um, conscious so... argument is even weirder because like what you said and then she goes on to be like but this is not uh this <laughs> is inherent in animals also so they they have this split as a potentiality but only in humans it goes on and then she is like human uh, animals could even have a symbolic and a language but what they don't have is the signifier for the luck in the other right. so yeah 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 it's so weird right. like so weird but like and yeah well to me that that kind of broke it open for me because it it, it made me understand that no we're not just like we're not just like being weird and choosing this metaphor because it's it's sensational and then therefore gets you know public traction um but that there is a point to that um and therefore that's why that is the point to it's it's reiteration in in this text and all of it is being used to try to explicate these the steps he took to get to Hegel actually meant that fourth one. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you if you read between the lines of of what Hegel is saying, you get to the fourth one. Otherwise, it is incomplete. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as audacious as that is, he is he is going to extreme lengths to to prove it. And yeah, he shows he shows the work. Mm -hmm. He shows the work. And what's hard for us is I I I don't know about you. I have not read the Crete. I have not read uh, uh Andrew and Nick uh have great videos on the seminars. Yeah, they are amazing. Yeah, yeah. on the on their the K Void channel that I think they said they're changing the name of. Oh really? Um but yeah, go to their playlist for the seminars and and I don't know, I don't think they did the Acree. They don't they didn't. And like they probably won't because Acree is shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Todd, Todd McGowan's opinion, not mine. So I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh I'm 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 just gonna read from Do We Have to to kind of put a nail in this this point of what of uh, that that I thought which is that he's he constructed this entire chapter around proving that fourth that fourth judgment. Um, do we have to add how this notional apparatus is related to the Lacanian triad of embolic, symbolic, and uh, symbolic, Im symbolic, imaginary, so good. <laughs> embolic, symbolic, real, 
the status of impossibility is real. Real as impossible. Again, we have another bulleted list, by the way. The status, the status of impossibility is real. Real as impossible, as impossible. Every necessity is ultimately a symbolic one. Imaginary is the domain of what is possible. Whereas the emergence of the symptom, which links together the three dimensions of ISR, is radically contingent. The, the petia is contingent. The symptom is contingent. All of the th all of that which is necessary is reliant on the contingency. And that split, that thing that that seems to be an impossible contradiction is precisely the point. The contradiction is what makes it possible for us to experience subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The imaginary thing is interesting. So like imaginary is the realm of the possible and also judgment of reflection is characterized by possibility. So uh, I think this is a nice point that imaginary is not at all separable from the symbolic, but like we can deduce in imaginary aspects if we analyze even judgments themselves so like this is where that baromian knot is a useful visual metaphor mm -hmm. it shows that it is linked like you said you cannot separate the imaginary from the symbolic and if you do what you are diagnosing is a con is a conspicuous mental illness <laughs> i believe it's called aphasia mm -hmm. The ability, the inability to take what you perceive and convert into a symbolic uh, structure and understand it is is aphasia. Wow, what a chapter! This is my favorite one out of the three, which we did. Like, yeah. I feel like it's my favorite one in the same way as like when you have three kids and one of them is a real fucking pain in the ass, but it eventually grew up, like. I've got this one at like teenage status right now, and it's a huge fucking pain in the ass. But I, I, it is my favorite so far, as well. Yeah, because when he starts the chapter, you are like, oh, this is going to be some abstract analysis of the judgments, is boring. But like when he ends up, it's like, wow, he reiterated those the three registers from this, like, it's crazy. And I, I think. I think we see here that we did all that as like a as a prerequisite for just this. Like all of that said all that to say this final paragraph. Um but without it this paragraph would be meaningless to us as the audience of this book. I think putting it in a a, a... I think it's platonic uh, concept of knowledge being the difference between being shown something and, and, and or mm -hmm. understanding something and then tying it down. And like mm -hmm. it, you did need, we needed to go through that, that crucible of, of seemingly bizarre, it, unconnected ideas to get to that tie down. The tying down wouldn't have happened. If you just have a statue, like you, that stuff by itself is just a statue, not understanding how it came to be. Mm. um this uh this this section it, it may also be I, I don't know i i i have the sense that out of all the chapters this is the one that that is also the best payoff from mm. i don't know he he writes a contract with you and it often feels like he doesn't pay the pay the pay the pay off the contract but this one actually has a payoff uh, makes me wonder if I maybe need to spend more time with those other chapters because I maybe it's the fact that I felt like I understood them quicker, uh, fate like duped me into not actually understanding them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but maybe also like maybe he just uh turns the screw every time and maybe it's like, yeah, yeah. it's cool. But I need like to have this placed in the context. So like some Mike or someone has to explain to me why why does he that do that those judgments again? And like I, we can understand what he did, but I I'm kind of struggling. Like was this just so that we understand how necessity arises in the symbolic? Yeah, if so, it's like yeah. Here's uh, uh, I I I just as you said that when you said why does he bring this fourth one 
I think it's actually to respond in a sense, it's the answer to the question presented in the last chapter, which was, uh, you know, is is Hegel actually a kind of just a, a I don't know, Monist. vulgar monist? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that that he just said, OK, here's the three judgments and that's that's absolute knowledge. There you go. I'm done. And the that's the that was the Derridian reading of it. That was the Fichtean uh take uh and what was what and when you read it that way then if you are reading it that way zizek's point is you're misreading hegel Mm -hmm. um and here's why you're misreading hegel you you didn't catch that he had a fourth step which was contingency and that contingency is what is the off-ramp from otherwise a monist it uh monist superstructure of knowledge that contingency is what allows it to actually move. Otherwise, it is just an object. It is right. a static fucking thing. But with the with the contingency uh, component, it provides the inertia. It, it's it's mm. what puts that that weight on the predicate that allows you that drives you to continue searching for more knowledge. Continue searching. Continue adding to the symbolic structure. I think I like that a lot. Okay, I think that's, that's perfect. yeah yeah. Okay, you're so so this is not like necessity is important, but contingency is like he wants to show that uh, you can arrive at it by like analyzing the judgments and like you don't have to do it in a weird like outside way. It's already in the system itself. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah, and it simultaneously provides a great case for using the Lacanian, uh, mm-hmm. you know, conscious unconscious logic uh i it's it's i don't know it feels it feels brilliant i feel like i learned three different things at the same time yeah and, uh, the symptom is so uh because like the logic of the symptom if from what i understand from the sublime object is that like the symptom is first so like it's not like you have some stuff in your unconscious already and then symptom comes after but like the contingent symptom is first and then through analysis you construct what was in the unconscious so you symbolize it so that would be again like the contingency is first and then you arrive at a necessity so like mm. yeah the necessity connect necessary connection between the symptom and the unconscious but it wasn't there like you just produced it through analysis yeah and then you recognized it after the yeah. fact yeah that's yeah, like yeah. the the uh well, I think he does, he gets into that example where the the private is looking for a medical discharge and and he oh yeah like like Klinger on Mash where he's trying to get the section eight and then over and over and over again until he finally produces it in the end, but the symptom existed. Um. Well, I think I think also I I think he he uh failed to take his mirror um his in the taint of the mirror i think he failed to take it far enough uh because it occurred to me that you know if he had looked at the physical properties of how how a mirror works he could have also used the fact that in the real a photon bounced off a thing bounced off another thing got in to reality eyeball, right then imagination occurred Mm-hmm. then some s- the symbolic register engaged to comprehend it these things happen in a d- definite historical sense but what you perceive as having happened is well after the thing that happened when we look at a star it's billions of years old it can be billions of years old of what we're looking at and we're seeing it and perceiving as it as a, as if we're seeing it right now but it doesn't could easily not even exist anymore in the real as we are as we are perceiving it uh and so i wouldn't say like not to say zizek failed or anything like that but that if had he continued i think that that would have helped reinforce the retroactive com- you know component of cognition but that would be like in order for this to work it would be have it would have to be like the light which reaches us is first and the star is produced only retroactively or something. Yeah. I mean, the 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 idea, the notion of the star is only retroactively produced. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, you don't yeah. even know if it's a star or a galaxy or a fucking quasar or a. Oh you yeah. Know, okay. Sure. Satellite. <laughs> the Russians. 
it's probably not the russians let's let's <laughs> let's let's just be real i mean it probably hasn't been the russians for a couple 20 years sergey <laughs> come back <laughs> um well have we have we reached our uh you know what I didn't like limit. about those, like the footnotes are at the end of the chapter. I don't like that because sometimes I would like to know what's in them, but I just, I just don't, cannot bring myself to go all the time to them. Dude. I want, I want to do the, the time lapse recording of me reading because it is worth going into these notes. Um, but reading alone, especially this stuff. Is difficult that that accountability factor amps up your ability to actually read and get through this stuff so i i i want to figure out a new accountability system for myself because going through this stuff is I, i've picked up a lot from going through the notes after reading mm -hmm. yeah the I notes think this, is where, this is where reading backwards can you can actually use this to help you read backwards if you want to you can just start at the end of these footnotes and then trace them to their their point in the yeah. in the uh you know in the text itself um but i i agree you know to me i i tried that uh with sublime object i tried it um and uh i, I realized that i spent more time i spent more time trying to trace back and forth uh, and I never really got the point of it, of things until I stopped doing that. And then, uh, even still, yeah, you gotta, you gotta commit to a reading and then doing stuff like that is after you've, you've done the initial reading and then you can actually go back and, and examine in further detail. But yeah, mm -hmm. if you go down the, the Wikipedia link hole, you're never coming back. Yeah. 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 It makes it impossible. Like, yeah, no, there's, mm -hmm. there's some gold in here though. There's definitely mm -hmm. some gold in here. Huh. Yeah, so we go on or uh, do we stop at this? I'm I'm getting close to when I'm gonna have to stop. Mm -hmm. I'm a little hesitant personally to get uh you know yeah, we wanna yeah, dip yeah. our toe. We wanna dip our toe in this first section. Wet the tongue with a little Wittgenstein. <laughs> <laughs> I know, maybe maybe we can start <laughs> it because like yeah, it's uh, he jumps into some Dude, I'm, I'm good yeah. i got i still got i still got 20 20 uh maybe 30 minutes so i mean All right i can i can i can go if y'all want to go so if I okay go let's do it <laughs> all right yeah. um you know what i'm i i will be not on the camera but i will be listening so feel free to copy okay chapter four on the other hysteria certainty and doubt Wittgenstein as a Hegelian. In logic, Hegel stages identity, imagines a subject saying, plant is a plant, and thus arrives at its truth, that is to say, demonstrates that identity with itself consists in the absolute contradiction and the coincidence of the logical subject with the void at the place of the expected but failed predicate by translating the identity of an object with itself into the satirical scene of a subject's procedure. Wittgenstein of the philosophical investigations is here extremely close to Hegel. A thing is identical with itself. There is no finer example of a useless proposition which is yet connected with a certain play of the imagination. It is as if, in imagination, we put a thing into its own shape and saw that it fit. We might also say everything fits into itself, or again, everything fits into its own shape. At the same time, we look at a thing and imagine that there was a blank left for it and that now it fits into it exactly. Does this spot fit into its white surrounding? But that is just how it would look if there had been a hole in its place and it then fitted into the hole. I think this goes to back to the how to count zero for one. Like the idea that we can count nothing uh, as something with the signifier. So this spot for the thing would be, it's maybe not signifier, but it's notion. 
uh, and that's why we can do this weirdo. Like, would this thing fit into the blank spot? Well, the blank spot is the notion mm. is the notion when the thing is absent. Maybe that's it. Yeah, the gap. Yeah. Okay. Like Hegel, uh, Wittgenstein determines identity with itself as the paradoxical coincidence of a thing with its own empty place. The notion of identity with itself has no sense outside this play of the imagination in which a thing occupies its place, its space, outside this procedure of staging. The crucial point here is that such a notion of identity implies the presence of the symbolic order. For an object to coincide with its empty place, we must in advance abstract it from its place. Only in this way are we able to perceive the place without the object. In other words, the object's absence can be perceived as such only within a differential order in which absence as such acquires positive value, which is why, according to Lacan, the experience of castration equals the introduction of the symbolic order. By way of this experience, the phallus is, so to speak, abstracted from its place. Mm. To determine more closely this uncanny proximity of Hegel and Wittgenstein, let us take as our starting point Lacan's designation of Hegel as the most sublime of all hysterics. Is this just an empty witticism, or does it stand rigorous theoretical examination? Let us answer this dilemma by starting with the most basic question. What characterizes the subjective position of a hysteric? I'm I'm sorry. As I'm as I'm hearing you say it, I don't think it would have happened if I was reading it to myself. But as I'm hearing you say it, I don't know if y'all used to watch old school Batman, the the, the Adam original West? TV show Adam West, and then at the end of the episode, it would always be like, "Does does Robin ever come to realize he's gay? Does Batman ever <laughs> like, enjoy uh, themselves together? Find out next like week." Rocky Same and Bullwinkle. Yeah. <laughs> Tune in like, next I've, week I've, to see if our heroes yeah. make it through this dilemma. But I, I, I visualized that 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 the spinning bat thing. But I saw I saw Zizek's fucked up face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does that'd ride be, in this way. Let's that'd see be a what great happens. graphic. <laughs> yeah. Ba, 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 um, <laughs> you know, so so he's 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 reiterating what he already said in the in the last uh, in the last section, which is that gap is what makes it possible for the, the thing to be i think what he's uh he's also pointing out is that Vich, he's he's saying wittgenstein kind of agrees with hegel that uh kant's supposed thing in itself is insufficient that Pl plato's forms are insufficient they don't they don't they they to they uh falsely totalize um but i i'm not sure if i'm all if I'm well read enough on any of it to actually say that with much convent conviction. Hmm. Are we uh, continuing? Sure. Uh, the elementary form of hysteria, hysteria par excellence, is the so-called conversion hysteria. I'm not even attempting it. Luke, Lucas, you got, can you say that? I don't know. Conversion. Con Con oh, I don't know. I don't know German. Okay. Conversion I, I think history? Con conversion history or something like that. Conversion history, which sounds like history uh, as opposed to hysteria. <clears throat> Weird. Yeah. Where the subject gives body to the, his deadlock, to the kernel that he is unable to put in words by means of a hysterical symptom. The abnormality of a part of his body or bodily functions, he starts to cough without any apparent physical reason. He repeats compulsive gestures, his leg or hand stiffens, although there is nothing medically wrong with it, and so on. In this precise sense, we speak of hysterical conversion. The impeded traumatic kernel is converted into a bodily symptom, the psychic content that cannot be signified in the medium of common language makes itself heard in the distorted form of body language. I mean, is he being... Is he being Fix. autobiographical here? <laughs> it uh, seems indeed. like he's talking about himself. 
Um, it's as if he predicted his own. Because this is from 90, I don't know. How long does, did he have this? Weird this would have been ninety uh, eighty nine through ninety three or something like that. He he didn't he w- he wasn't doing the tick thing. Uh, I mean, in in the videos around that time, he wasn't doing any of that. So it's, it's another weird. story. It's on... Do you know the story behind the tick? Like why he got it? So I heard that Miller was uh, psychoanalyzing him, and like when doing analysis, your symptoms they switch around. Like you get different ones, and once he got the tick, he was like, "Fuck that! I don't want to see what's next." And like, I quit analysis, and <laughs> so that's why he got the tick. It was not a random because uh, he's worried. Oh. He's worried it would turn into impotence or something. Like his dick wouldn't work <laughs> if it kept going. He oh my goodness! His final form. It's. Crazy. I would rather my dick not work personally. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> For then... somebody who spends his entire life talking, it's just crazy that he would just go. You know what? The tick's fine. I'll just yeah. I'll, it's I'll crazy. Just with... And I don't know if he finished analysis, and that's why he does not have it now. But like, it's interesting. I mean, if 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 he's taking his own words to heart. He's recognizing that his ticks are the manifestation of of something that is impossible in himself, which is his his reflection on the big other. And if he truly believes what he's what he's saying, then he should recognize that the big other does not exist, and then there's no need for the tick. It's the same thing. If you get the hiccups, if you have the the cognitive faculty to convince yourself you don't need to have hiccups, you can stop having. The hiccups it is totally possible um that's some it's something level of mental operation i so mean i'm not if, if we convince the masses that uh we don't need money we can cause money to stop existing well kid, the fact of the anxiety in the face of this gpt situation dude is is that precise circumstance mm-hmm because it's it the reality is if if all of the point of human effort could actually be done in a box, then what would be the need for currency after that? People's needs would be met, and we'd just be making art. From this uh, brief sketch, one can already guess where the connection with Hegel lies. A homologist conversion is what defines figures of consciousness in Hegel's phenom- phenomenology of spirit. Lordship and bondage, unhappy consciousness, law of the heart, absolute freedom, and so on, are not just abstract theoretical positions. What they name is always also a kind of existential dramatization of a theoretical position whereby a certain surplus is produced. The notional surplus, I think, is the callback here. The dramatization gives the lie to the theoretical position by bringing out its implicit presuppositions. In dramatizing his position, the subject renders manifest what remains unspoken in it, what must remain unspoken for this position to maintain its consistency. In other words, the dramatization reflects the conditions of a theoretical position overlooked by the subject who holds to it. The figure of consciousness stages, figures, the concealed truth of a position. In this sense, every figure of consciousness implies a kind of hysterical theater, a red hat, for example. Mm. We can see already how the logic of this dramatization subverts the classical idealist relationship of a theoretical notion and its exemplification. Far from reducing exemplification to an imperfect illustration of the idea, the staging produces examples which paradoxically subvert the very idea they exemplify, the red hat, for example. Or, as Hegel would say, the imperfection of the example with regard to the idea is an index of the imperfection of the pro- of proper, the imperfection proper to the idea itself. I don't know about you guys, but my mind is kind of worn out and... I don't know if maybe we should stop because like I have a empty mind right now. Well, we don't want you starting to sniff and tick, that's for sure. Yeah. Um I'm I'm alright. What with I'm that. saying is maybe we kind of 
went with the drive and like uh, mm, yeah yeah some yeah surplus but maybe we went overboard or something i don't know and now your dick doesn't work god damn it no that sorry was dude before. that was also before <laughs> so it's fine <laughs> I'm good with it. I'm good to uh, to stop. I've got a uh... full day. Yuppers. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. We finished, what was it, chapter three? Yeah. We did that. And this chapter three for the eighth time. Yeah. But now it's done. And we can go in. And... Yeah, forget did, about it entirely. <laughs> did uh did we take a note of that that we wanted to explicitly point out to Mikey? Um I will that's that's a good point. I don't think I did, but I I will uh I will highlight that in my copy. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm gonna go the next level. I'm gonna I'm gonna set I'm gonna make a uh fuck dude. You know what? I'm gonna put it in the shared notes. Oh dude. I need to start using that resource. That's you know, I hate to say it, it's hardly a resource at the moment. Um it, but we it, can make it. We can we can absolutely be using it as a as a as a resource what what it what it what it is at the moment and actually that's really unfair of me to say um it, it is very much a resource at the moment it is also it is also almost completely just nikki writing um right. and so mm -hmm. so it is uh, not to say it's not a resource because she's done a fantastic job of keeping notes uh but that it is not being used as a shared notes so much as we are reading nikki's notes so right. she's got the uh, team on her back right now. So basically she's carrying us. Um, and, and, uh, I, I think probably we, we ought to articulate that, but I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put in this, in, in these notes that, uh, to, to ask Mikey about it. Nice. Mikey. Nice. Uh, let's see. 136. And then next week hopefully we'll have time to get together do some more reading um and then we'll see you guys saturday yeah saturday cool awesome possum yeah all right dope see you thank guys. you guys have nice yeah have a great day all right we'll see, see you guys later bye bye peace